Hey, it's Jay. I wanted to extend a special thanks to those of you who have listened and left reviews on iTunes for this podcast. Please leave a review if you haven't done so already. We sincerely appreciate it. We're producing this show independently, and unfortunately, that is not free. We have to pay for digital hosting space, software, equipment, websites, and travel out of our own pockets. But we'd love to keep this show going as long as possible. Pledge your support by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. Thanks for your support, and enjoy the show. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, powered by Scent Lock Enforcer, episode number 187. Barry Wenzel, Whitetail Boot Camps, Deer Movement, and Terrain. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by the Scent Lock Enforcer, Advanced Takedown Tree Stands, and Morris's Sporting Goods. <laughs> Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. No, Chuck Testa. No, Chuck Testa. No, Chuck Testa. And you're still listening to the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm trying to say that three times and not screw it up. Hey, this is Hal Blood from Big Woods Bucks. And you're about to push play on my favorite podcast, The Big Buck Registry. This is Laura Zara from Naked and Afraid, and you're about to listen to my favorite podcast, The Big Buck Registry. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Jay, and I'm just hanging out here in the studio with my good buddy, Dusty Phillips. He's in the Ohio studio. I'm in the New Hampshire studio, and you know, we're getting ready to do this podcast thing. I'm getting pretty excited. We've got a really, really, really good show coming up this week, and uh, you don't want to take out your your notepad, I think. Dustin, God. what's going on in your studio? Ah, uh, man, I'm just relaxing, chilling out, getting ready to hammer out a podcast, and uh, I'm thinking about doing a little turkey hunting. <laughs> turkey hunting? Uh, man, you be- you're talking about New Hampshire camp? Yeah, turkey camp in New Hampshire. I'm excited, man. Dude, we had so much fun last, last time. It was just... I've missed it since the day I, I boarded the plane to come back home. I've missed it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Just just had a blast. I can't wait for the snow to melt. Now, bear in mind, we've got about 18 to 24 inches of snow on the ground right now. And it's crazy. I, I can't wait for it to go away. I, I actually busted out my snowshoes yesterday to just to walk through the woods because I haven't snowshoed in a long time. I haven't needed to. Last year, we didn't have any snow, and... Now I've got more snow than I can uh, shovel. We're actually running out of spaces to put it. But got the snowshoes out, and I'm the reason I was doing that is because I'm trying to do some more coyote hunting, and the snowshoes are going to get me to my spots a little easier. But it's uh, man, it's just it's just I'm sick of it. Sick of it already. I like that think, that nice comfortable eight inches of snow. I'm thinking like, dude, get get a snowmobile. Heck with the snowshoes. Well, you know, I, I used to have a snowmobile, and then it kind of just. Uh, I bought it used, and it worked real good for a few years. Then it just kind of, you know, was at the end of its life. Ended up giving it to a buddy to tinker with, and I haven't replaced the old girl. It's time to though, because I really need to get out back out to my coyote spots. And man, walking in snow—not that it's—I mean, it's fantastic for you, but it, it's exhausting when you're just right. walking in boots. It is exhausting. That's 18 inches. I mean, that's knee deep. That's right. Right. You got to pick your leg up over the snow to get through it. And then you never know what the heck you're stepping on underneath or what you're falling into. Could be, you know, especially where you're, where we're hunting in a lot of these spots, it's all swampy. So you might be falling into uh, two feet of water covered over by snow. It hasn't, hasn't frozen over some of these, these swamps, you know. Right. That's crazy, man. But, but yeah, yeah. That, you know, I, I could. I can see where you're ready for the snow to be gone and some warmer weather come in. Yeah. It's supposed to be 60 here tomorrow in Ohio. We have no snow, 60-degree temperatures rolling in. Everybody's sicker than a dog, and I'm sick. Kids are sick. My buddies are sick. Everybody's <laughs> sick of this crazy weather. But other than that, it is pretty nice here in Ohio right now. Everything's kind of thawed out and starting to dry up a little bit. We had mud last week, and now we're getting back into some firmer soil. And I was able to drive my truck out to the cows, and I haven't been able to do that in a few days. You know, Jay, we had uh, 
probably one of the Valentines, one of the greatest Valentines I, I can will ever remember. You know, uh, he, you know what? It was a very, very significant day for us, and you're absolutely right. Why don't you tell everybody what happened? We had uh, Big Buck Race or Deer Hunt Podcast hit one million downloads. And then on Facebook, we hit a quarter million followers. Man, if that don't get you excited, I don't know what will. And, you know, if it wasn't for everybody that's listening with us right now, it it wouldn't be possible. And, uh, you know, we sure do thank you for that. I was stunned that it happened on the same day. You know, we've been, you can kind of see these things coming as you, you know, you see the pattern of the downloads coming and had no idea until the day before that it looked like it was going to happen all on February 14th. The same day, we turned 1 million downloads and 250,000 followers on Facebook. Unbelievable. That's, that's really unbelievable, you know, and, and thanks to everybody that tunes in with us every week. We, we appreciate it. We love everybody that listens to us, and uh, we'll continue on. And, and I'll never forget everybody that's ever connected with us on this show, all the great people we've met, all the people that we're still going to meet, everybody that's ever downloaded the show or listened to our show. Um, it's just absolutely just makes my day every single day when I think about everything this show has become and has allowed us to do and all the great content we've been able to provide and hopefully helpful information to everybody that's a hunter out there to make them better hunters and getting get into the sport and get outside. Speaking of other success stories and things that have come out of this great adventure we're on, we are still running the harness program. I've got the list all sorted out. So we actually are in need of more harnesses and more requests. So these are all spoken for the ones we have. So if you have harnesses that you would like to donate to our program, please shoot me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com. You can also hit Dusty up, Dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. Likewise, just use those emails to reach out to us. If you either have a harness to donate or have a harness that you need. There seem to be a lot of people that actually don't have harnesses. And I, I think it was just kind of a an oversight for a very long time. And, you know, you just kind of went without if you couldn't afford it. So we're trying to change that and get, get these in all these spare harnesses that come with a lot of these tree stands now. They can go to the hunters that don't have them right now. Absolutely, you know, and if we can help somebody save their life, it's, uh, that means something to us. Absolutely. We want to make sure that you're able to go out in the field as much as possible safely and get back to your family. So we said that we had a great guest coming on this week, and we it's, it's a phenomenal guest, Barry Wenzel. Now, if you've heard of the Wenzel brothers, I don't know anybody that really hasn't heard of the Wenzel brothers. If you're a hunter of any sort, the Wenzels have been around for a very long time. I think they are, are credited with shooting the first video of the bow kill shot on video. That's how far back they go. And from all the people that we've talked to over the years, frequently, these hunters that we hold in high regard as talented hunters with some amazing skill sets reference the Wenzels as being their kind of mentors or the people that they look up to as the best deer hunters they've ever met. And we had met Barry a while back when we first gathered at the Great American Outdoor Show when this show was just getting off the ground. And we had kind of earmarked him to be on the show at some point. We put it, finally, finally we put it all together. We spoke to Barry and we got him on the show. And believe me, of the next hour and 45 minutes you're about to listen to this interview, it will seem like 10 minutes has gone by. But you will want to pull out a a notebook and a piece of paper and a pen because this show is loaded. And I mean loaded with information. Absolutely. But before we get to Barry, let's go to Jim Keller with the Deer News. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. And our first story this week, Jet Leaving Charlotte Hits Deer Makes Emergency Landing. This story was originally featured on the Charlotte Observer website. It was reported by Joe Maruzak. An American Airlines regional jet that was taking off at Charlotte Douglas International Airport struck a deer at about noon Wednesday, causing the crew to declare an emergency and return to the airport. The American Eagle plane was headed to Gulfport Biloxi International Airport in Mississippi with four passengers and four crew members aboard, American spokeswoman Katie Cody said. The CRJ 700 
struck the deer during its takeoff roll. The flight crew declared an emergency and then did a flyover so personnel on the ground could inspect it for damage prior to attempting a landing. The jet landed on runway 18 left, 36 right, and passengers evacuated on the runway. They were returned to the terminal on buses, Cody said, with no injuries reported. Firefighter crews met the plane and sprayed flame retardant because it was leaking jet fuel. The runway opened shortly after 2 p.m. after an inspection and after the plane was towed away. The Charlotte Douglas spokeswoman Lee Davis said the airport will evaluate how the deer got on the runway as part of its wildlife management plan. Surrounded by over 19 miles of barbed wire topping perimeter fence, Charlotte Douglas is also ringed by thousands of acres of wooded land conducive to deer. Wildlife strikes aren't rare in Charlotte's airport, but they don't usually cause damage. The FAA had 47 reports of wildlife strikes at Charlotte Douglas in the first four months of 2016, the most recent period available. Almost all of the collisions were small birds or bats, though a coyote and a raccoon were also struck on Charlotte's runway last year. Wednesday's incident was a sixth deer versus plane collision at Charlotte Douglas since 1994, according to the FAA. Trappers prevail in Maine Lynx incidental take lawsuit. This story was originally featured on the Deer and DeerHunting.com website and was reported by Alan Clemens. Trappers in Maine and the state's Department of Inland Fish and Wildlife won a court battle February 15th against a lawsuit filed by four animal rights organizations regarding incidental take in regard to the Endangered Species Act. The ruling was handed down by U.S. District Judge John Levy. The Sportsman's Alliance Foundation joined trappers and the Maine DIFW in fighting the lawsuit. Here is a press release from the foundation about the ruling. On Wednesday, February 15th, U.S. District Judge John Levy issued his ruling in a lawsuit that sought to revoke the State of Maine's Incidental Take Permit, ITP, which would open individual trappers to Endangered Species Act, that is ESA, violations. Judge Levy ruled the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's use and application of ITPs were unlawful in and in keeping with the requirements of the ESA. The ruling is a clear victory for the Sportsman's Alliance Foundation, Trappers in Maine, and the Maine Department of Inland Fish and Wildlife. In this ruling, Judge Levy found that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's actions were in keeping with the requirements of the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, and the Administrative Procedures Act. The case, filed by the Anti-Hunting and Anti-Trapping Groups, Center for Biological Diversity, the Wildlife Alliance of Maine, the Animal Welfare Institute, and Friends of Animals, was essentially a backdoor attempt to use the Endangered Species Act to stop trapping in the state. At the heart of the legal battle were incidental take permits, which are granted under the ESA and provided for limited incidental taking of federally protected species. Without such protection, individual trappers and state wildlife agencies could be held liable for ESA violations every time a lynx was accidentally caught in a legal trap. Canada lynx, which are listed as a threatened species in the U.S. due to fragmented populations at the southernmost range of their habitat, are abundant north of the border in Canada. In fact, there are many who believe that the lynx populations should be removed from the ESA altogether. This is not the first time that these Sportsmen's Alliance and Maine Trappers have prevailed, prevailed in trapping litigation. In 2010, they successfully defended against a similar lawsuit that also tried to use the Endangered Species Act to stop trapping. That case paved the way for trapping to continue. Joining the Sportsman's Alliance Foundation in the most recent case was the Maine Trappers Association and the National Trappers Association. These stories are important for us all to be aware of, as similar tricks have been tried in other states with other species listed on the Endangered Species Act list. These animal rights groups take a temporary situation, like a species population being down, and try to do permanent damage to our hunting, trapping, and fishing rights and traditions. I encourage everyone to check out our show notes and read the full story. New DNR estimates show Wisconsin hunters took more deer in 2016. This story was originally featured on the Fox 11 News website. Updated data from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources shows hunters killed about 4,280 more deer deer during the past nine-day gun season than they did in 2015. Preliminary estimates after the season ended in November put the kill total at 196,785, which is down from 198,057 in 2015. However, updated figures the DNR released February 7th show hunters took 202,338 deer during that season. 
DNR officials said when the season closed that they still hoped the kill might match 2015 as hunters who missed the deadline for registering their animals reported in. The number of gun deer licenses sold in 2016 didn't change from data the agency released immediately after the nine-day season. Hunters purchased 598,867 licenses, down from 612,377 in 2015. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller with the Deer News. And without further ado, here is Barry Wenzel. Barry Wenzel, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? I am excellent. Um, I, I can't complain at all. I go. I kind of go into a little bit of depression when the seasons end, but then I start to realize that it's, it's building for another year, and, and I kind of get into a better mood after a while. But I do enjoy sharing my opinions and so forth, so I'm looking forward to this. I, I kind of get down into that depression a little bit, and, and this year I've changed my tune. I've decided to do more coyote hunting, so it's uh, it's oh, helping, did you? yeah, it's passing, it's helping me pass the time. But then we got lots and lots of snow, so now I'm having a harder time getting to my spots because I don't like walking through sure. 18 inches of deep snow to. Well, that, you know, I just, did you know that nationally you can tell where a guy's from by the way he pronounces that word? Guys from back east a coyote guys from the kind of the midwest or west will say coyotes and the guy the real cowboys they say coyotes coyotes so really right. i knew right away you were from, from new hampshire you knew i was from the east yep. <laughs> makes sense totally <laughs> makes okay. sense. anyway uh, really they said it perfect that the the He's a dead on, Jay. He is spot on. It's a di- it's a dialect of, of the pronunciation of, as I say, coyote. There you, go. you don't have a, a New ha- My wife is from New Hampshire, and you do not have the New Hampshire typical accent, so you must not have uh, been born there or been a native there, were you? I, uh, I grew up uh, born in, in Vermont, grew up in New Hampshire, and uh, somehow... Oh, did you? Got, did, of, and I grew up all around the uh, deep backwoods dialect believe me uh but somehow i, I managed to not that's kind of like me i've got a combination i lived you know in several different states so um and my my folks you know did didn't have an accent per se yeah so um uh, people have a hard time registering where i'm from i'm familiar but with anyway. it and i can kick into the the di- the the accent if i need to to fit in but this is my normal voice okay oh, well, Barry, we're excited to have you on the show, and we've been actually we've talked about amongst Dusty and I have talked about having you on the show before, and that your name has come up ironically several times as we've talked to guests, and the guests that we've talked to are are people that I don't consider to be novice hunters. I mean, these are some hardcore hunters, but they always revert back to you and your brother as being one of the almost the forefathers of teaching whitetail hunting specifically bow hunting in, in the united states and and often refer to you uh, as some of the best deer hunters in the country and have been for some time so well we're, we i i appreciate that but you know i i should say that it's probably because it has been i've been so fanatical about it um you know our entire lives, every, everything kind of ends up being coming full circle and being uh, whatever you want to say in the, the timing, et cetera. Um, Gene and I are identical twins. Consequently, our whole lives we've had, you know, the, we had a good close family relationship and our whole lives we uh, we're born with hunting partners, so to speak, and two heads better than one. And you add into that the little bit of competitiveness between, you know, brothers and, you know, not necessarily, you know, hardcore type thing, but, you know, ha ha, I got a bigger one than you type of thing. And, uh, <laughs> that, you know, where I, I would hit a, a situation, I might have been, you know, 19 years old and I would look at something 
and say to Gene, um, look at this, you know, if, if unless, you know, unless I'm wrong, this is what I'm seeing. And I would explain it and then say, what's your opinion? He would give his two cents. And um, almost every time, two heads better than one. And we we started coming up with theories back then. And now you got to realize this is in the the 60s and you know even in the 70s and so forth that that uh like gene wrote his first book in 1980 and uh, he you know he came to me and said i think we ought to write a book and i said no i'm, I'm not really interested i number one i didn't want to be become known as you know an authority and number two i didn't want to be thrust in the spotlight and everybody you know kind of what's he doing now, what, watching every move and where he's parking and all this stuff. But anyway, so I said, no, you go ahead and write the book, but, you know, and I'll give you my input, which is what happened. I mean, he wrote the book and I, you know, gave him my theories and stuff. And that's exactly what it was. When that first book came out, it was basically nothing but theories, which have become fact have mm-hmm. since become fact. So, I mean, when that first, our, our um, opinions came out, we had deer biologists, you know, say, hey, where'd you guys come up with this stuff? This is this is good stuff. This is the missing piece of the puzzle. And, you know, how do you know that, you know, and we would just give them our input. Mm-hmm. And we are not biologists, but we were uh, avid woodsmen you know, type of thing. And we, right. we, uh, were willing to share that with a lot of people and so forth. So, um, again, it's, it's, you study anything or do anything for a long enough time and you'll become good at it type of thing. You know, gotcha. so, well, I, I consider anyway. you to be a uh, whitetail hunting, uh, royalty. Let's put it that way. Well, thank you. Thank you. And you know, everybody, everybody kind of, uh, in fact, that, that's a good question. I've had people say to me, do you consider yourself more of a bow hunter or do you consider yourself more of a whitetail hunter? And if the truth were known, I mean, I consider myself more of a whitetail hunter. I, I just hunt with a bow and arrow and I just hunt with traditional equipment. But the reason that I started bow hunting was because it, you know, the sec, the two season type of thing. And all of a sudden I realized I, uh, in order to, uh, we were raised with good morals and ethics and, you know, uh, never had any, you know, legal problems or whatever. So, you know, my point is if, uh, in order to maintain the ability to hunt, I wanted to handicap myself so that I could spend more time out there legally rather than just go, you know, shoot a deer opening morning and then be done with it type right. of thing, you know. So anyway. Barry, let's go back a ways to when you and Gene were uh, just kids and, and starting to uh, understand <laughs> and learn the woods. Uh, can you Can you bring us back to, like, your earliest recollection? Wow. Earliest recollection. Um <laughs> I mean, you know, I was really little. Um, my our, our dad was an avid hunter, and frankly, it's always been interesting to me because he taught us a lot of woodsmanship, you know, uh, skills that, frankly, I don't know where he got them from. Uh, his family didn't hunt. He was the only, you know, person in his family that I know of that hunted. Hmm. And, um, he, he, again, tended to be a loner. Um, he lived a, a lot of his life in cities, you know, but we had a hunting camp in, um, where we lived in New York state and in Connecticut and Vermont. And we had a hunting camp in upstate New York that we would go to literally every weekend, you know, for, you know, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday type of thing for decades, years and years and years. And dad, as a um, father, son, I, frankly, if the, you know, I think that the, the main reason we started hunting with bows is he thought we would get in less trouble um, shooting arrows rather than BB guns or 22s. Right. And uh, <laughs> so he put, he put bows in our hands and it just kind of, 
you know, never went away. I mean, uh, um, it's just, we stayed bow hunting. And again, I, I, we went through the, the general kid routine of, you know, I mean, a 22 and then, you know, worked our way up and, and, uh, I started hunting deer with a rifle and, and, you know, after a couple of years, I mean, this, you know, oh man, I'm done. You know, I'm going to have to either go to another state or, you know, yeah. take, take up bow hunting. So that's, that's basically what we did. But, uh, um, we were self-taught, um, and dad would kind of point us in the right direction and answer any questions, but um, he believed that you know we needed to experience um, the the situation to, for the knowledge type of thing, and he was absolutely right. You know, so gotcha. Can you remember any of the lessons that your dad taught you? Yeah. Um, in fact, I wrote something about this. I don't know, less than a year ago. I don't remember. I lose track of time, but I remember. When I was, I'll bet I wasn't eight or 10 years old, dad telling me, if you're hunting and you see a deer and he's looking at you, that you could raise your weapon vertically and maybe get away with it. But if you swung it horizontal, he'd bust you every time. And I'm sure dad had no idea. In other words, I'm sure that was self-taught. He didn't understand why. Mm -hmm. Well, nowadays, uh, well, I, years later, I researched it and it's because of the rods and cones in a deer's eye that, uh, in other words, the rods are motion detectors and light sensitivity, whereas the cones are color sensitive and determine high resolution, uh, uh, vision type of thing. So, and then deer don't have, uh, an ultraviolet filter like humans do. So in other words, things appear to glow to deer, especially in low light conditions, which coincidentally is when they're most active in the low, you know, so, right. you know, um, coincidence, I think not type of thing. But, uh, uh, and then he also taught us that like prey animals, the pupils in, in prey animals tend to lie sideways in the eye versus predator animal, animals that are predators have more or tend to have more of a round or a vertical pupil. And it's all, in other words, you think about an animal that, that's prey, the reason that pupil is horizontal is most of the animals that are preying on them come in from the side, you know, the, the bobcats and the, the mountain lions and the coyotes or whatever come in ground level horizontally versus, you know, um, the, like a birds of prey come in vertically type of thing. But, uh, right. at any rate, it, it was, he was way ahead of his time. I remember him teaching us that, you know, that you can, if you raise your, your bow or your gun vertically, you know, you can in and pull it straight back. Um, your boat, for example, you can maybe get away with it. But if you have your boat down at your side and you swing it up, swing, draw, um, you're going to get busted every time. So anyway, like I said, it was one of those lessons that um, I'm sure dad had no no idea why, but he taught us. And as later in life, I I verified he was absolutely dead right. You know, so. That's a great tip, and I have a feeling that this entire conversation might be filled with little things like that, if I'm, <laughs> okay. if I'm not mistaken. So I'm pretty psyched because I don't think we've heard that yet on the great. show. Your dad taught you a few things about the woods, uh, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you and Gene, are, are, it sounds like you're just, you were good buddies from the start, and you spent a lot of time in the woods. What, how mm-hmm. old were you when you first killed your first deer uh, on your own? <laughs> And were you with Gene um, at the time? For, actually, um, it was later in life when we lived, you know, back east, and you weren't allowed to deer hunt until you were 15. Um, and consequent, you know, where we lived and where we hunt, where my dad hunted and stuff. So consequently, we didn't, I used to go, and I, I, even as a little, I say a little kid, you know, I mean, I was 10, 12 years old, I would go running around in the woods. And, and I remember 
living in Connecticut that where there weren't even any deer. And I heard somebody saw seven deer up on this mountain on the edge of town. So, I mean, I went up there and uh, started to, quote, practice. And, I mean, I didn't have a gun or a bow or anything, but, quote, practice was to go look for tracks and sign. And, and uh, you know, I mean, I would see stuff that, um, you know, back then a lot of people didn't even know what it was, you know. I mean, the, the scrapes on the ground and, you know, the pe- back in the 60s, you know, or 50s for that matter, people would see scrapes on the ground unless it was a knowledgeable hunter they would think, oh, it's turkey scratchings or the deer's pawn for acorns or whatever type of thing. Right. I mean, they didn't realize the the science or uh, what's happening with, you know, deer scrapes type of thing. And right. uh, um, as we got older, in fact, till it to this day, there's a lot of people who don't understand, you know, uh, deer scrapes and stuff and the, the, the uh, function of a scrape and, you know, between the, the – uh, the, the social structure of the animal is when a buck scrapes the ground. Okay. Basically they pull their tarsal glands together to urinate over the, the tarsal glands, hot glands. All right. They deposit the scent into the, the, the fresh dug up earth. Okay. And two things happen there. Number one, he deposits his own personal scent. Each animal within the herd has a distinct different aroma odor um that and you can use an i'm big good on or big on analogies it's it's kind of like uh, you separate the cows from the calves you know when they go brand them or whatever they're doing and the mother they they come back they the the cow and the calf come back together because of the scent she doesn't recognize which one's hers visually or anything like that. it's all due to scent so each animal has a distinct aroma and additional to that each animal, when he urinates over his his uh, hawk glands, he deposits his health. And people don't understand this, or they find it hard to believe. But in other words, a healthy animal, the scent of the urine of that buck, if it's a healthy animal, he's metabolizing, you know, fat molecules. If it's an unhealthy animal, he's going to be metabolizing protein molecules and that they'll have a different aroma to it. So that doe can come up to that scrape. She can smell where that buck urinated and she knows that that's Bob, the, the eight pointer. And, uh, uh, he's healthier than Jim, the, the uh, 10 pointer, even though Jim has more points on his head and she picks the one that she wants to be bred by. It's totally up to her. If she doesn't want to be bred, yes, the buck will continue to harass the doe, but she can, she can just, all she has to do is keep walking. So she makes the determination on what, what is, is the most desirable sire, Hmm. you know, in the, the herd, which one she wants to be bred by type of thing. So that's the science behind a scrape rather than just people thinking, oh, look, you know, one pawed the ground here, he's upset or he's pawing the ground because he's, you know, frustrated or whatever. Um, So anyways, a little more to it. Gotcha. It's interesting. Very interesting. Fascinating, actually. (laughs) So going back to the 60s and and 70s, the the deer population Mm -hmm. back then was not what it is today. And Correct. how did you deal with that as you were learning when there were less specimens to, to learn from? Basically, saturation, spending more time. Um, it, in fact, it's been funny over the years. Uh, when I was a young guy, I used to almost brag about the fact or I was proud of the fact I could go into a new area and run through it and quote learn it and as i got older i found that um i would go in run through the area not quite learn it but then come back later at an, you know whatever another a second time say whether it be a week or a couple days later or a month later or whatever but to come back at a second time and slow my pace down <clears throat> so that i would be learning putting accumulated knowledge, meaning, uh, um, you know, adding what I learned 
a week ago with what I learned two weeks ago and then slowing the pace down so I can take all these things in. And now, like I say, I, I any more, uh, well, a lot of it's just nothing but age, but it, you know, in other words, any more, I go into an area and I tend to start off slow um, and really thoroughly learn it. Um, in other words, sometimes too much is too fast is too much and the type of thing. And you miss anybody will miss a lot of the details. You know, when I scout, I, in fact, I prefer to do it alone. I do this land consulting thing with, where, um, a landowner hunter or whatever, you know, will buy, I just, I did one in Oklahoma last two weeks ago yep. and th- this guy hired me to come in and I walked, he had 600 acres um, I'd walk his 600 acres and basically I would ribbon off trees for potential tree stands. And um, I tell the landowner, no offense, but I want to be alone the first couple, three days. You know, how many, I, I, normally I'll, I'll average two to 300 acres a day. So it's a, you know, Say it's a, a 600 acre piece, and it depends on how much is huntable terrain and how much is cultivated fields, et cetera. But I'll go into a, a piece of property and slowly walk it, and they don't understand. Um, I might stand in one place literally for a half hour or 45 minutes, taking in all the pieces of the puzzle. And if the guy, if the landowner is with me, they end up usually telling me war stories about. You know, oh, I, my my wife got a big one over here, and I jumped a monster over there, and you know, and, and I don't want to hear that stuff. I want to. I'm looking at pieces, of, I mean, details, and I want to, you know. And then the last day, and I'll I'll make my decision, and then the last day, I will take the landowner by the hand and walk around and show him the trees that I've picked and explain why I picked them, how he, you know when he when he should hunt it and how he should hunt it et cetera et cetera so that it's a it's a learning experience for him but i i slow my pace down you know a lot more than i you know i used to when i was younger and so forth you know but i was i was one of those guys i kind of i couldn't get enough i hunted i've hunted all over the united states and and uh, as i said i got a good variety of different hunting terrains and and uh, um, again it's just it's a person it's that's why I do this for personal satisfaction and that's what I really enjoy so. gotcha what what is a run through a piece of property as you described when you're younger versus now what what is that well, pace like it, it kind of depends on the the property itself um, meaning the several factors, meaning like density versus, you know, in other words, if it's hardwoods or softwoods or a combination, if it's flat terrain, if it's hilly terrain, if it has any creek bottoms or r- river bottoms down through it and so forth. So any more, like, uh, as I said, um, it used to be the first thing I would do would look for, would look at drainages. So if it's any kind of uh, variation in the terrain, um, I mean, that's what I I base my entire hunting success on, understanding deer movement and the terrain. Um, I just dearly love, no pun intended, um, setting (laughs) up a situation where I go in and study the terrain and figure out what deer are doing and then specifically pick a particular animal and key in on the the uh, exact animal in that exact terrain and set up my my hunt my stand or whatever ambush whatever you want to call it um you know accordingly and then back out and wait for the proper time to, in other words, everything is in the, in the right timing and so forth, but wait for the proper time and then go in and have the animal do exactly what you thought he was going to do or predicted he was going to do and then either capitalize on it and, you know, kill him or, or let him go type of thing. But my point is that uh, setting up the situation, 
a lot of times is nothing but studying the terrain. And, you know, these, I call it the boot camps. In fact, it's a little bit embarrassing. I, I've done those, these whitetail, you know, classes. This will be my 13th year. And when I started them, I started calling them boot camps because it was boots on the ground and we we're staying in the camp. But um, now they got, <laughs> they got marriage boot camps and all kind of boot camps on television and <laughs> right. divorce boot camps. And, but anyway, so it basically they're cl- they're white uh classes at, that uh, and they're they're three days long. Um, the first day is basically classroom stuff where I spill my guts and explain everything. And then the next two days, we actually go in the, wood, boot, in the woods, boots on the ground, and I will show them my own personal deer stands and explain why they're there, how I hunt it, when I hunt it, etc. And as I said, there's so many times guys will you know say to me, I was so close, and, you know, I just, you know, what you just taught me is going to change the way I'm going to hunt the rest of my life. I can't thank you enough. And as I said, there's a lot of gray areas, meaning, and I explain it, it's it's like uh, you can you can read all the books and the magazine articles and go to the seminars and watch your DVDs and TV programs and all that's, you know, fine and, and well, but um, when someone, the practical application, when someone takes you by the hand and takes you into the woods and points out things, that's where the real learning becomes obvious. And I use the examples, it's like edge. You know, when you read and hear whatever, somebody will talk about edge in a seminar and uh, the the person in the audience, you know, they're thinking edge where the field joins the timber, okay, whereas I'll take the people in the woods and I'll say, notice the understory here is thicker than it is right over here. Where that goes from thick to thin, that's an edge. Notice the reason that this is thicker, it's more dense, is because there's less canopy on the, the, the trees right here. Because, in other words, it might be softwood versus hardwoods, but there's the 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 the, the hardwoods will drop their foliage, the softwoods won't, and therefore more light, or it's been logged off, or light will come in, and it will generate thicker understory. That's an edge where it goes from thick light intensities because of the the light filtering in from the canopy. And again, these are things that are hard to understand or misinterpreted by you know the the student of the whitetail where it's you know when i take them in and point that out a light like a light bulb goes on and they're oh yeah now i get it you know type of thing and anyway it and it i really enjoy sharing and especially since you know people go home i want them uh, again i i try to to have you know like hunting partners or brothers or dad and dad and the kid or whatever will come and i want them to go home when i'm walking around i want them to say you know look at what i point out and think hey this is just like behind the barn type of thing that we got at home and then or they get talking back and yeah yeah you know this is just like you know barry showed us when they get home type of thing and i here, here's a good example um ah, it's been about 10 years ago and in fact, I can't. I, I don't even remember the guy's name. I think he was from Wisconsin or Minnesota, maybe. But anyway, it was a father and a son. The son was 16 or 17, something like that. They came to one of my sessions. They went through it, which is they're normally in March, February, March, April type of thing, you know. And then that fall, he sent me a letter, or email, a letter, I guess it was. But anyway, and he thanking me, he said. Um, he owned, and it wasn't a very big piece of property. It seemed like it was like 80 acres or 60 acres or something like that. And he said he was raised on it. And he said, um, I walked, he said, my son and I both killed our bucks this year out of the same tree. And he says, I walked by that tree for 20 years and never even thought 
about putting a tree stand in it until something I said during the weekend. I, in fact, I, I wish I knew what I said. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, apparently something I said, a light went on, and the the, fa- the father's buck was Boone and Crockett. It's, it measured 173, if I remember right, and the kids was uh, missed Boone by an inch. It was 169. I mean, both of their the biggest bucks in their life out of the same tree that he walked by for 20 years. And, you know, that's what I'm saying. That's very rewarding to me when I can change, like, especially the son, you know, and uh, as I said at the time, I think he was 16 or 17. So he's probably 26, 27 now. But what I'm saying is, you know, it probably changed the way he would look at, hunting property not just his but anywhere he hunts the rest of his life type of thing and uh, i i'm very proud of that anyway gotcha it's fascinating do you do you have any like milestones that or moments in time over the years that you consider milestones as a hunter that you can reflect on i have been really fortunate my my entire life well let me put it to you this way um, if I had to live my entire life over again, and I don't know very many people that can say this, but there's hardly anything that I would change. Um, I mean, I've been fortunate that my wife and I were going to do this year will be our 50th anniversary. I mean, she's great. I'd marry her in a heartbeat in a second. We raised three kids. All three kids are excellent, upstanding citizens. They don't smoke, drink, do drugs, never been arrested. I mean, they're they're good kids. The same, you know, uh, I've been able to spend time. It's because of them and their generosity that I have been able to do what I want to do. And But in the same respect, I know my limitations. In other words, uh, um, I don't push things too far but uh you know as far as milestones go um i've killed you know some of the biggest bucks that i hope there that are in my area um i have probably over the years and i say this hesitantly but um um i lived in montana for I mean everything's in the timing and I lived in Montana for almost 30 years when I first moved to Montana again I strictly bow hunted basically and I was there was 10 species of big game right around I lived in northwestern Montana and there was 10 species of big game in Montana that I could have hunted had I drawn the right permits but they were right there but I spent 90 percent of my time pursuing whitetails and because of the quality of the animals and and the you know the studying it but um now i look back on that and i was really fortunate because it's not the same anymore um when we when we we lived in north i lived in northwestern montana in the flathead valley and gene lived in the Bitterroot, like 100 and 10, 120 miles south of me. And, you know, even that was totally different terrain. But we would, when we whitetail hunted, we basically hunted the river. And, and Montana's a huge state. I mean, it's 600 miles wide. I mean, you go 600 miles from New Hampshire and I don't know, you're in North Carolina or something, you know, but I mean, it's a long way. And consequently, we would make a circuit. Gene and I would go together and we would. We, we would usually take our, quote, vacation was uh, the first two weeks in October. Our bow seasons in Montana opened in first of September, but I never hunted the – I tended not to hunt the whitetails early. You know, I would go antelope hunting or elk hunting or muley hunting or bear hunting or whatever until October. And then the first two weeks in October, which happened to be the last two weeks – of the bow season, Gene and I would take quote our vacation and we would make a circuit and we would basically hunt the major river bottoms, the the Milk River and the Missouri River and the Yellowstone River and, you know, make make circuits and stuff. And we would go into a farm and we found the first day would would be the, be, uh, the best and the second day would be okay, pretty good. Third day, just okay. And then the fourth day, it would be 
poor. So what we would do would go in and we'd hunt a farm for three days, leave stands there, leave them set up in the trees, and then move on to the next property, hunt it, you know, for three days, and then the next one it would would make a circuit and come back, you know, through, and then it would all the would come finally come make a circuit and come back in our stands at all we'd have three more days of you know excellent hunting type of thing so as i said that we spent more time just you know whitetail hunting but it, when we did that that was eastern montana um and i, I won't even get into that the the details but uh it, back then i mean you would actually well we we guided some um in the nineties and for what was it seven years and during that se- those seven years, I used to the hunters the paid clients that we would come in um there was there was uh twenty we would take twenty eight hunters a year okay I would take two guys and Gene would take two guys and we we hunted seven weeks of the eleven week season so you know twenty eight different you know, uh, guys type of thing. And we, they figured out, I mean, we averaged, I can't remember what it was, 96% of our hunters with this bow hunting only shot record book bucks. And the, they, I would program these, these guys and I'd tell them, this is your hunt, but you got one, one tag, you shoot any deer you want, but you only got one. And I would suggest now, obviously, if a Boone and Crockett runs up next to you the first day, shoot it. But I would suggest that you, you know, not shoot one the first day so that you get a feel of what you're potentially going to see. Because, I mean, so many times, you know, these guys, they didn't believe us and they would shoot, you know, a little four by four the first morning, you know, and, you know, and then kick him. Oh man. You know, and I'd say, Hey, you're going to see between 200 and 500 deer in the woods while you're bow hunting, you know, today, each day type of thing. So in other words, and, and, uh, again, this was when it was in its prime. Whereas now, I mean, today they, the EHD hit the episode, hemorrhage disease. Um, they, it wiped out the entire, Farms that used to have lush green alfalfa fields that literally had two or three hundred deer standing in it, you can drive by now and there's there's a doe and a fawn, you know. Oh, I wonder why they, how come they made it, you know, type of thing. I mean, they're just totally wiped out, type of thing. So things have changed over the years, and um, uh, we moved from Montana. Uh, I, I moved in '99, you know, so. You know, I've been gone a long time, and I they did when we lived there, we didn't have wolves, you know, to to deal with. I mean, they, they as I said, there was uh, uh, no bow hunting competition. I said competition. We were, you know, I, we hunted for decades, never heard or saw of another bow hunter. You know, I mean, uh, there just there weren't any type of thing. You know, and nowadays, you know, that you got to stand in line type of thing or apply for. X number of permits, so I'm getting carried away. Go ahead. Oh, that's totally fine. When when you were younger and you were trying to understand what was going on in the woods and, and mm-hmm. digesting those things that that you were learning as you, as you walk through, were there other influences mm-hmm. in your life other than your father? That and I know you said you were self taught a lot, but was were there other people that you looked up to or turned to for more education at that time? Um, not really. I'm trying to think. Um, you know, after when I moved to Montana, you know, I had several friends that were really into it too. But most of the of our friends were, you know, they were either into elk hunting or you know whatever of uh, you know sheep or speed and you know hunting you know moose in Alaska or whatever it may be. So you know, I mean, we might have we might have hunted together, um, you know, for whitetails. But um, I tended to to be uh, absorbed with the you know as a student of the whitetail, and um, frankly, uh, as I said, I, I can't really say there was anybody that I had to fall back on or ask. And they didn't know. I mean, uh, you know. Um, it was okay. Here's another example, the EHD when, you know, which is a, it's similar to blue tongue. When that first hit, 
in Montana um, on the Milk the Milk River drainage, um, the 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 biologists they came to us and said, "What's going on?" You know, I mean, wait a minute, you're a deer biologist and you're asking me? I mean, I, I have no idea what's going on as far I mean, I'm just fine. And, but there was a lot of stuff that was not factual. For example, um, I was told, and then again, again, this is back in the 90s, so it's changed drastically. They're much more educated on it now. But I was told originally that uh, EHD, that it was non-sex specific um, meaning it, it killed just as many does as bucks. It was non-age specific that it killed just as many trophy bucks as yearling bucks or whatever. Okay, but when we went out in the field, you know, I remember, and I don't remember the exact figures, but it, it was like Gene and I, we found 70, 70, 70 dead bucks mm. on the farms that we bow hunted and two does, you know, and uh, that's oh. pretty lopsided when it's supposed to be 50 fit. Something's not right there. And of the 70 bucks, 90, I think there was one forky and one three by three and all the rest were four by four or better. So we're talking, you know, uh, three and a half to, you know, and up four and a half, five and a half year old bucks. And so it was wiping out entire age structures out of the herd. And consequently, the, the, the biologists, like I said, um, I don't think they had a clue. You know, now I'm sure they do now, but I, I kind of gotten away from it because I don't live there anymore and I don't hunt right, there anymore. Right. So anyway. Fascinating. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It is interesting when you get, when you actually, you know, you can, you can read everything you want, but until you actually get your feet wet and hands dirty and see mm-hmm. what's actually going mm-hmm. on out there, um, it doesn't really mean much. Mm-hmm. Wow. Sure. Excellent. Uh, I wanted to, to, I mean, we've been talking about some strategies here along the way, but I want to turn the segment over to Dusty here and get into some, some additional personal strategies that sure. you have. Sure. Uh, I want to start out like when you, when you talk about, you got the knowledge, what, uh, when you went to the woods, when you was a young man, what made you be successful in the whitetail woods? Where, where did you get that information from? A lot of that was self-taught, and I didn't know what was going on, but um, I talked it over with my brother, and I started thinking, and a lot of that stuff is nothing but common sense, and you have to realize, I mean, I'm fanatical about it, and I I do have a sense of of whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, uh, common sense, but I also like to analyze things and think whenever I see something like that, why are they doing what they're doing? And then I might stand there for a half hour and, you know, try to figure it out. And, uh, I remember, okay, put it to you this way. I remember the day that I, uh, suddenly realized how much uh, a mature whitetail differs from the rest of the herd and how they determine their movement strictly through their their noses, through their sense of smell. And during in my seminars, I ex, I explain that, and I'll use an example. If you've got a mountain with a field, a cultivated crop at the bottom, whatever a alfalfa field at the bottom. All right, just uh, science, meaning the the hot air rises. All right, so the deer will tend the, to bed up high on the mountain and feed down low. All right, the normal scenario is to differentiate buck movement from the rest of the herd, mature buck movement from the rest of the herd. Okay, in the afternoon, while the th- and we're talking thermals, not no winds or bit per se, but anyway, the thermal currents are rising up to the, the bedded deer at the top of the mountain. All right. In the afternoon, the, the herd, the majority of the herd, the does and the fawns and the immature bucks will get up and they'll start to work their way down the mountain toward the food source with the, the breeze, the, the, the air in their noses, in their faces, so that they can determine if there's any, you know, danger down in the field, all right? The big buck 
remains bedded at the top of the mountain, all right, and you just think of the logistics of this in a common sense, why they're doing that, the big buck will remain bedded at the top of the mountain until the rest of the herd gets down in the field, all right, and he'll wait for dethermalization. So when the air cools in the evening, then it starts to come down the mountain. So then he has the wind at his back, so he's got the rest of the herd out in front of him acting as decoys and I mean if one button buck busts you down in the field you don't even know the big guy's around I mean you know he's over the mountain and gone type of thing so my point is he's using the rest of the herd and the wind currents to his uh, advantage for security that's the exact reason the, the biggest bucks are usually the last ones to enter the field just before dark. The exact reverse is true in the morning when the, the thermals are still, you know, coming down the mountain. He will head, he'll be the first one to leave the field, head up the mountain to the bedding ground with the air coming in his face, the thermals coming in his face, he can smell anything in front of him, and the rest of the herd covering his back door. You know, so that he's the first one into the bed. So, as I said, that's that is uh, whatever you want to say, common sense. But most people don't realize that until they really think about it. When, when again, I was fortunate enough to to whatever you want to say. You know, it, it struck me or think about it like you know, you know. Hell yeah, that's what's happening, type of thing, you know, and uh, um, be able to to uh, understand. And they, again, the, the 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 sense of smell, how a deer, you know, lives its everyday life. I mean, they take things for granted that we it totally goes over our heads. And once we realize that we, whatever you want to say, uh, you know need to think about why they're doing certain things. That's what's going to differentiate, you know, the guy that, that really is successful versus the guy that just that locks out, you know. Um, frankly, you know, again, I, I am kind of, uh, whatever you want to say, depressed with the, the kids these days or the way – modern hunters are teaching our youth um they're they're kind of and, and again i don't mean any offense and it's totally legal and it's totally up to the individual but the average kid anymore thinks that you know deer hunting is sitting on a food plot in a in a shooting house you know playing his game boy or whatever you know whatever he's doing you know, and, you know, wake me up if a big one steps out and I'll pop them, Dad. You know, I mean, they, they're they losing, which is, again, if that's what they want to do, it's legal, and et cetera. But I'm saying I get so much more satisfaction out of going out in the woods and scouting and planning and putting the pieces of the puzzle together and, you know, figuring out what potentially might happen and then – have it happen and then capitalize on that occurrence and, and as i said it's just so much rewarding and that's the reason i'm doing it you know i'm not doing it for you know i want to get another big one on the wall type of thing and show off the you know the neighbor or whatever you know so anyway I, did i very off of the subject any <laughs> oh no you you did find it and when you talk about okay. the, the skill level to, to kill a big buck where <laughs> When you when you process you know the the scent control of yourself and and what the big bucks are doing, then what was the next step to to process and improve that skill level? Can you walk us through the next step after you once you figured out that that the buck has has got the nose and and usually the more mature buck's going to wait on the herd? Where do you go from there? Um, I fall asleep at night thinking about scenarios and trying to. Um, forecast what I think they're going to do. Um, I do it scientifically or whatever. I always thought everybody did this, but I have found out, you know, that they don't. Uh, and um, again, if, uh, well, like, okay, here's what I normally do. All right. I mean, I, I live in 
in Iowa. Um, I, I manage a piece of property that my neighbor owns. Um, I can hunt it. Um, it's one of those deals that, you know, there's, you know, I mean, he, he owns it and, and all kinds of guys can hunt it if he wants them to, but right. I have kind of programmed, you know, the landowners to realize if you keep it bow hunting only because of the range limitation on your weapons. And if you, you know, limit your, your, uh, deer kills to mature bucks. And I don't mean just mature bucks, but fully mature bucks. I try not to shoot a deer unless I think it's at least five and a half years old type of thing. So, uh, there's a, again, if a guy, now I'll take those for, you know, meat deer or whatever in management purposes. But if, if a guy wants to shoot trophy bucks, I mean, I, there's so many guys that, that, that I'll see him on TV saying, you know, he's mature, he's three and a half or he's mature, he's four and a half. Well, they're, they're four and a half. They might be quote mature, but they're not fully mature, you know, type of thing. And if he would have waited one more year, it would have been that much better of an animal and biologically speaking, it would be better. But anyway, I have multiple tree stands. What I do, I preset my tree stands. I'm constantly, I was out yesterday, you know, I mean, scouting and stuff. I mean, you know, and in fact, I've over the year, I've gotten trouble doing that where uh, I remember one landowner kicked me off because I was out scouting in, in, I don't remember when it was May or June or something like that. And, you know, uh, he was, I come out and get in my truck and he, here he comes pulling out, he had roadblock, you know, and I don't know what you're doing, but you got to be up to no good. And that guy happened to be a, an avid baseball fan. And I said, you like to watch baseball games. And I said, I like to watch deer. I, and he says, oh, bull, you know, I mean, the deer season doesn't open until October, you know, and <laughs> you're, I don't know what you're doing, but you're no, you're up to no good. I don't want to see you again, you know, and <laughs> so. Anyway, and here I said, "Hey, stop me! I mean, look at my truck. I got a pair of binoculars and a camera in here. I don't have a, I don't, I don't even have a gun with me or a bow or nothing. I mean, I'm just scouting type of thing, you know. I don't care, you know. Anyway, huh. like I said, um, I spend a lot of time, but I I will set up my stands accordingly. Then I I normally either uh, name the stand or number it. If you can't think of names, number it. No, most of the time, other people name them, but okay, but I have a a list of eight different wind directions, you know, north, south, east, west, northeast, southwest, east, you know, northwest, southeast. Okay, so I got eight wind wind directions, and then I have morning stands and evening stands, all right? So every year I will categorize each one of my stands, and I'll say, like, where we live here are predominant in the October, basically, our predominant wind direction comes out of the southwest, all right? So I, I'll go to my charts, and I'll have 12 uh, stands that are good for a morning stands in the, in the southwest. And um, then I'll, I'll, I'll have, you know, 10 more that are good for morning stands for the northeast, all right? So then I get up in the morning, and I'll turn on the computer, go to the weather, and I make sure you use a weather site that has the hourly changes and stuff. And I must say this, when I lived in Montana, west of the Continental Divide, they, they were terrible. Our, our winds were nothing. You, you couldn't depend on it. It often, you know, sometimes came down in the Pacific Northwest, sometimes out of you know, Canada. So, but anyway, in the Midwest here, they're excellent. I mean, I'll, I'll open up the, the weather and they'll say, you know, a southwest wind, you know, from whatever, six o'clock in the morning, and at two o'clock, it's going to shift to the west, and three o'clock, it's going to come from the north. So I'll go to my charts, and I'll I'll look at those. I got whatever, you know, 10 stands that are good for a southwest wind in the morning, okay, and at two o'clock, it's going to shift and come out of the north, okay, so the, the afternoon, um, uh, if I sit in that southwest stand, I'm going to get busted. It's going to be defeating the purpose. I'm just going to be educating the deer. So I want to change stands and go to, um, you know, a, one of my on my list of eight for north, whatever I said, northeast winds. And so I can plan my hunt 
and hunt my plan accordingly type of thing. And that way maintain less um, uh, disturbance to the, to the, to the, the woods. Uh, I mean, I've always been under the impression that one of the most important factors um, is hunting undisturbed deer. When you can, you know, hunt deer that are, I mean, uh, like a lot of the guys back east and, and just through the, the sheer population, um, meaning um, there, there's so many people to deal with. I mean, not just the hunters, but the bird hunters and the squirrel hunters and the rabbit hunters and the, the pheasant hunters and the, the uh, joggers and, uh, you know, um, anyway, all kinds of activity and stuff. Right. Um, and where, whereas if you're hunting undisturbed deer, that's where you're going to be able to uh Take boy, when you say take advantage of a situation the way it's supposed to be, meaning you know the, the deer are going to be moving the way on their own, not out of uh, a defensive mode, so to speak, you know, type thing, you know. So hey, I got I got a question, and I'm dying to ask this one. <laughs> you know, having trophy whitetail boot camp, uh, can can you get into? Uh, I know we don't have time to cover the whole boot camp. But I'm I'm dying mm-hmm. to know. Can can you kind of spill your guts on, on what you sound like in the classroom at the boot camp? Or okay. yeah, what do you what yeah. do you cover in that that the, that opening? I rec- I don't have like I say I don't have a specific program. It's just like our conversation here that I might have some notes written down, and I don't have to refer to the notes. But the reason those notes are written. This, I want to tell or share um, uh, whatever the subject is to the, the attendees because, I mean, a lot, some of this stuff is, you know, um, unknown. I mean, uh, um, as I said, I, 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 there's so many guys, I mean, I'm willing to share it, but a lot of people, I mean, they're, they're I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to downgrade it but they're playing little league ball type of thing and and uh, they don't need to be and it's so much more fun when you know you, you have all these pieces that you can fall back on and uh um oh okay here's a, here's a perfect example um the wees and I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that the the biologists call it grunt snort wees but i i just refer to it sure. as a wees and I started wheezing in deer in the early 80s, I think, is when I started. So you got all the 80s and 90s, all the two, you know, so, you know, I mean, 40 years of doing it. And no, until I start, I, I finally started sharing it. I don't know, uh, I lose track of time, but 15 years ago, maybe, I started telling people about it just because I thought, you know, I wanted to share it type of thing. And, you know, nowadays, I mean, um, again, uh, they got commercial wheeze calls and, you know, and uh, again, I'm not in it for the money. Um, in other words, uh, and I'm a big believer that, and uh, I'm sorry if you have any sponsors that make wheeze calls, but uh, you <laughs> can don't. make the sound of a wheeze with your mouth 10 times better than you can with a wheeze call. I have a commercial you know, I, I hear the ones that, that that they sell commercially, and it's just like a, you know, it's just very dry, hollow. Whereas the the one you make with your mouth, it's moist. It's and, and again, I just I I teach people how to do it, but it's a, you know, I mean, it's it's moist and it sounds identical. And I've been doing it for whatever it's been, 30-some years. And I'll tell you right now that every year I will wheeze in multiple bucks that I would not would not have a, a, any chance at, meaning they're out of range, they're walking away. I watch the TV programs. And, I, again, a, knowledge, a world-class hunter, he's got his own TV show, you know, and here goes a big buck walking away. And he'll go, oh, man, you know, and he'll snort or rattle or whatever, and the deer will walk off, and he doesn't wheeze. 
And I guarantee you, had he wheezed, I mean, I've I've got it on film dozens of times where the deer is out of range, going away. He's he's cutting cross country, and I'll wheeze at him. He'll spin on a dime and turn around and walk up and stand at eight yards, looking around for you. You know, and you have to you're forced to shoot your way out. You know, but. Uh, um, I enjoy sharing, but there's, there's, uh, some of it, the guys, you know, are opinionated and, you know, and they, they've been kind of programmed their whole life. Don't make any noise. I mean, stealth and be real quiet, but they don't use any common sense type of thing, you know? So anyway, um, I got off on a tangent there again, too. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> no, these are great tangents <laughs> for sure. For sure. So that's yes. a taste of deer camp. Well, I say all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, again, I I use uh, examples of, like I got a sandbox, okay? I'll put, like, moist sand in it and make a a little mountain to show the the attendees an example of how deer um, use, you know, their their noses to everyday movement and stuff. In other words, okay, and I'll try to, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to understand when you can see it, but I'll try to explain it to you. If you've got a, a, a ridge, all right, and say the deer, um, the ridge, say the, the, say the ridge runs east-west, and the food source is at the east, across the road to the east, and then if you go to the west, the ridge kind of, tapers down and goes down to a creek bottom, all timber and stuff. All right. The normal uh, scenario, is there might be, uh, say, a, a, a human activity, a logging road. And I'm talking about a grown up, not even a, a maybe not even drivable, but an, a, an old logging road that, that's on top of the ridge that they used to use when they logged the timber 50 years ago type of thing. All right. Say your predominant, and again, the ridge is running west, east, west. Okay, your predominant wind direction, say it's like around here, it's coming from the southwest, all right? In the morning, the deer might walk the, the logging road. A human activity is generally they'll walk the, the flat on top of the ridge where the logging road is. I mean, that's why the logging road's there, so they don't have to side hill it. And before light, the deer will walk that logging road, all right? But one, And once it gets light, again, most of the time they, some I shouldn't say most of the time, sometimes they'll walk that logging road in the middle of that flat, but in the morning, and you think about the reasoning behind it, they've been up all night, there's been no activity, you know, no traffic, no hunters, no, you know, everything's been all night long. Everything's been cool. All right. But then in the afternoon, they'll work down and they'll bed on north on the, the slopes with the, the southwest wind at their backs. So, in other words, they're bedding. They can see what's in front of them through the open hardwoods and they can smell what's over their back. So they're they're secure. They're safe all the way around, all right? In the afternoon, when they get up from their beds and start to walk that ridge back towards the food source, they will always, almost always, walk on the downwind side of that ridge. They won't walk on the top where they walked in the morning. They will walk over the crest. So they're not, number one, they're not skylined. And number two, they can smell anything that's upwind of them and they can see anything that's downwind of them in the open hardwoods. So they can see where they can't smell and smell where they can't see. And they'll use that movement pattern to go from their bedding to their to their feeding source. And most guys don't have a clue, in other words, how you can set up. They'll, they'll set up their stand either on the food source out on the edge, and, you know, the deer will, finally make it to the food source just at dark and oh man it's too dark to shoot now or whatever or or they'll set up on the flat where uh in other words they're on on the way the deer they think the deer are on the way out because they saw them go in there in the morning but the deer are you know downwind over the edge and they're going to get busted every time type of thing so how you set the thing up 
is going to determine exactly you know the the success of the of the hunt and stuff that these deer they move every every time they move there's usually a reason behind it and that when you, that's what you need to do is to start to think you know why are they doing this and and is is how can i capitalize on that that situation and stuff um again it's just it's it's really interesting and it's just nothing but survival i'm mean, gene and i go around about that a, a lot of uh, we disagree on some things too and you know <clears throat> one of them is in other words you know he's of the opinion and he's right deer where it's a gray area but deer don't reason and i agree deer don't reason but they also but i say they do st- things that are uh, instinctive meaning um okay if you got a deer you're up in a tree stand and you, you got a deer feeding, you know, eating acorns out there in front of you. And 300 yards away, a deer snorts. All right. That deer that's feeding underneath you doesn't reason and think, okay, let me think now that the wind's coming from the Northwest and that deer is okay. There must be something up in that field. So I don't want to go that way. I got to go, you know, they don't reason like that. Okay. But they, they do have, an instinctive, whatever you want, a comfort zone. So if that deer snorts, you know, 50 yards from it, yes, then, oh, there's something going on here. I'm out of here. Whereas, you know, if he, if he snorts three, 400 yards away, it's out of his comfort zone and he doesn't really care type of thing, you know. So as I said, it's just, uh, it's you know, kind of a lot of that stuff is nothing but common sense and stuff, you know, but. Uh, um, another thing, I, I like I say, some of these things I keep thinking of. That, that an example of something that I do all the time. That you know, I thought everybody did this stuff, you know. But <clears throat> I when when I have these camps, you know, I'll share these things, and I'll have guys say, you know, one of the things that impresses them is the um, how much detail. I put into a particular stand setup, meaning um, I shift. If, if I'm if I'm in a stand, for example, okay, say the the, the trail is going east west, all right, and my stand is on the north side of that deer run, all right, and you hunt it on a southerly wind, so your scent's blowing from the from the deer trail to your stand, all right. All right, you, again, say the deer trail is 25 yards from your stand. Uh, I'm a 15-yard guy. I mean, I prefer my shots to be 15 yards, you know, and especially in my older age and stuff, I've got, you know, some health issues. And so I, I, I tend to shift the deer movement, and I can do it every time type of thing. So, and I, I'll explain to these guys, okay, perfect example uh, just the scenario I just described. I say that the deer run is going east west, uh, and the, the 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 feed, the crops are to the west, and uh, the bedding area is to the east. So in the morning, the deer go from right to left, west to east, and you're facing south. All right, all right. But they they go by at 25 yards. All right. If I want to shift them closer to me, I will hinge cut a tree on on the north side of the major deer run and for, now the angle and hinge cut is very important meaning I'll cut I use I usually use a 6 or 8 inch tree and I'll cut it through enough so that I can manipulate the way it drops the direction and angle of the of the drop and as using that same scenario I'll drop the top of oh, the tree will be on my side of the run and I'll drop it to the southwest so that the top of the tree, the thicker part of the tree, will drop to the southwest. Okay, and that's very important because the 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 whatever you want to call it, the blockage, the the visual that that deer gets is more brush and, and leaves to his right going from west to east so again and you don't want to drop it perpendicular to the run 
because if you do, and I, I'll cut him at approximately four feet high. So you want it high enough that he's not going to go over it, but low enough he's not going to go under it type of thing. And you drop it at that angle so that when he walks down that run, here's a tree blocked, with, and it's angling at a 45 and it'll kind of nudge him with the most of the, the cover to the right. It'll nudge him to the to the left towards your tree stand, all right. And he'll go around that barricade. Then I take a rake. I use I well I use again I between uh, I use a hoe. I mean I'm not a a, a rake, but uh, the rake the, the the leaves get stuck in it too much. But I'll I'll take and I'll I take a hoe. And I'll in the the understory or in the the leaves, I'll rake a visual path around that barricade. And I mean, again, here comes the deer going from his food to his bedding. And oh, there's a tree down across there. And oh, it's kind of angled, and I don't have to jump across. That's too thick over there. I'll just you know. And he ends up. He shifts his move. Oh, there's a trail right there. You know, he'll shift his movement pattern and end up walking by twelve, thirteen yards instead of twenty five yards. And then. Your boogeyman is there to take advantage and, you know, decide whether to shoot him or not type of thing. So, as I said, you know, I do a lot of detailing that, uh, wow, why didn't I think of that? And I just hear these guys, you know, say, and that's what I enjoy, you know, sharing and stuff. I mean, uh, and in fact, it's, it benefits the sport. In other words, if I can, and I, I should recurve, but, you know, I mean, you know, some of these guys are, you know, they can shoot them in the eyeball at, you know, 35, yeah, I've read that, you know, oh, it was a slam dunk 35 yard shot. You know, I don't even shoot him at, you know, 25, no less 35. But anyway, my point, my point is that, that you can increase the, if you, in other words, rather than shoot at a deer at 25 yards, yeah, I think I can do that, but that's right on the edge of my effective shooting distance. In other words, if you can shift them to 12 or 13 yards, you're going to be a better shot and, be able to to uh, you know keep the the percentages up you know be less likely to wound them and right. et cetera you know right. so anyway Absolutely. you're you're a rolodex of information that's for sure Barry I asked you um, in the beginning I want to transition into a new segment here I want you I asked you to think about a memorable deer hunt that you've been on and I was wondering if uh, you had one in mind. And if you do, could could we go on that trip with you? Elaborate on it. Elaborate. Yeah. On it. yeah. In fact. In fact, I, I shot two two good bucks this year. The one, which was the second one, I shot him on November twenty first, and it was a. I'll remember that was one of my all time favorite bucks for a couple reasons. Um, but anyway, and the, let me play the scenario back and show you or explain the difference of how. I do it versus how, you know, most guys would have done it type of thing. Okay. All right. But anyway, this is in a big patch of basically big patch of timber. Um, and there is a food plot in the surrounded by timber. It's a small food plot. It's only, I don't know, maybe an acre and a half at the bottom of a ridge. And the reason the food plot is there, uh, in fact, People probably wouldn't believe me if I told them this, but it's a fact. I've never shot a deer in a food plot in my life. I'm not against it, but I just never hunt food plots, but or hardly ever. You know. But anyway, my point is that I noticed when I would come down, there was a logging road, a skid road coming down the mountain into the food plot, and there's, there's the plot, and then there's a ridge on the other side of the plot, another hardwood ridge, so the plot is kind of in a valley. All right, And I noticed years ago... Every time, depending on the foliage, meaning when the, the canopy, when the leaves still had leaves on it, you could go down the road itself and get away with not being seen and sneak and you know sneak down into the food plot. But as soon as the the, the fall foliage, you know, cleared the leaves out, you know the the if you walk down that road, every time I did it. I would see I'm just walking quietly down a logging road and I'd look across the valley and there goes six or seven or tails or three or four or whatever. I'm spooking deer because they saw me walking down the road. So to to alleviate that problem, before I drop down the road, I cut off to the the left, which happens to be west, 
and drop down through the timber. Again, I'm out of sight, totally out of sight of the food plot. I drop down through the, through the timber to the bottom, and then I hit a, a dry creek bed in the bottom, all right? Rather than uh, walk the dry creek bed up to my stand, I walk away from the stand downstream in the dry creek bed, cross, I come up on a flat in the other side, go across a weedy flat, and then follow an old hedgerow up to my stand. So I'm, quote, unquote, coming in the back door, okay? But it's hundreds and hundreds of yards out of my way. But what it does is it leaves the area totally undisturbed. They don't have a clue I'm in the area. And that's what I did this year. And you know, again, I went down over the hill. I hit the creek bottom, walked downstream, came up on the flat, came up to the hedge, the hedge row across that weedy flat, walked up, climbed in my stand. It was uh, the afternoon of November 21st. I'm going to, I don't know, I'm going by my memory, two, three, two o'clock in the afternoon, maybe. But anyway, I was in the stand for like a half hour. I looked up, and here was a, it's a two year old non-typical he's one of the i saw him a half dozen times this year i got a you know uh, video footage of him i saw him you know in half dozen different stands but he's one of those he's a really neat buck with a lot of character but he's only two or two and a half you know and i it's one of those you look at and you go, oh man what's he gonna look like when he when he gets to be five and a half or six you know but anyway I looked over, and here he comes. He was all alone on the flat across the, the creek, and he stopped and was, he was very cautious, but he, I had the wind to my advantage, and he walked down. He got in the creek bottom, and then he turned, and I couldn't see him anymore. I filmed him when he first was on the flat, but I couldn't see him when he got down to the creek. Then I'm looking for him, and all of a sudden something catches my eye, and here's a, uh, it was a nice, heavy, kind of a honey blonde 4x4, four Good, pretty decent mass, you know, a more mature deer, probably a four and a half year old buck. But he saw the little non typical, and he was, again, the four by four, he was all, you know, puffed up. It's, you know, his ears laid back, and he was, you know, all his hair standing on end, his head cocked. He was, you know, confronting the, but I, he dropped down in the creek, and I, you know, I knew they were confronting each other, but I couldn't see him good, but, you know, I could see the body language. But anyway, they're down in there, and I'm trying to film it, and then all of a sudden, um, I see on the other side, uh, it was a, actually, it was a three by two. I recognized him, too. Came out of the creek. He come running out, so they chased him out, and this is all like, I don't know, 125 to 150 yards from me, and then I look across the creek, and here's a beauty. I mean, an absolute shooter. Um, you know, I'm going to see you. I don't think he was boon, but he was 160 inches, just a big, fully mature. I'd never, real white antlers. I'd never seen him before and stuff. And he's walking parallel to the creek and all of a sudden two does come up out of the creek. And I don't know what was going on because they were out of sight and, you know, but there was no bucks chasing them. I don't know if they were fighting or whatever, but anyway, I could see this action and the, the, the big buck was not coming by me. So I went ahead and it was a little bit breezy and it was dry leaves. So I went ahead and I wheezed because he wasn't coming by me because I was going to, if he came close, I was absolutely going to shoot him. All right. But anyway, so I wheezed and he dropped down in the creek and then the, again, the the couple of the, the little other deer came out and stuff and I couldn't see him and stuff. And then I could, he didn't come out and he didn't come out. So I went ahead and wheezed again a second time and still nothing. And I questioned, did he hear me or is it too windy or is he cannot not hear me because he's down over the creek or what? But I wheezed twice. And then for some unknown reason, I turned my head and looked over my shoulder and here comes this big one, you know, coming in. And it, it struck me instantly that, you know, he was downwind of me or just – and I, I do that a lot. I set it up at um, almost the wrong angle, meaning the the wind was out of the southwest, and he was coming directly south to north. 
you know, so he was right on the edge of my scent stream, but he had, but anyway, he was standing there 40 yards away and I instantly knew, you know, I was going to shoot him, you know, give him a chance. He was a good one. And anyway, and I, I said a little prayer, you know, and all of a sudden here he comes, you know, as soon as, as soon as, you know, he started to come, he, and he jumped, there was an old dilapidated, but, uh, you know, it's still up, uh, internal barbed wire fence right there next to the stand. And he jumped the fence probably, I don't know, five yards from me to my right. And then he cut, as soon as his hoofs hit the ground in front of me, he broke into a, like a, I say a run, a trot. And, you know, I haven't shot a, I used to be known for my, you know, running shots, but I, I haven't shot a running deer in 10 years and stuff, but he was, he was, 10 yards and it was a nice steady gate and I just swung on him and sunk one right behind, right behind the shoulders and stuff. And it was perfect, you know, perfect hit, perfect, complete pass through. He didn't even know what hit him and stuff. He arrow stuck in the ground and he ran over and stood on the, the and I could see him flip. He, he, he was, I don't know, 75, 80 yards away and stuff, but he was flicking his tail back and forth and, uh, yeah, you know, which is a good sign. I mean, he's he was. I knew I, you know, he he was toast. But anyway, and finally he just stood there, and then finally a couple seconds later, he took a couple steps forward, and I literally took my eyes off him for one second. I looked back, and he was gone. And I wasn't sure if he dropped or if he stepped forward. It ended up he did both. He took one like one or two steps forward and fell right there, you know. But anyway, uh, he ended up. Uh, he was. Uh, 160, he measured 161 and two eights. Uh, basically, um, it was a, uh, what was he, five by, he had a, a basic five by four, but he had split brow tines and a busted tine. He was, but he had big bases. His, his bases were, it was, they were six and a half inches on the one side and six and a quarter on the other and 25 inch main beans and, you know, 161 and two eighths inch buck. And, and then I got looking at him. And I recognized, I mean, he's a couple things. Um, I knew he was at least seven and a half years old because I had pictures of him last year. Uh, well, back in, uh, what was it, 2000? Let's see, that was last year was 2016. I think it was 2013 or 12, maybe even 12. I had pictures of him, and, man, he was a big buck then. I mean, he was, you know, big, wide, massive. I mean, it's definitely him. It's the same deer, you know, very similar antler characteristic. But anyway, so he was at least seven and a half. I haven't got the teeth back or anything yet. But my my point is that uh, um, he was seven, seven and a half. And then all of a sudden, um, in, in fact, I got to say this. The picture, I, I could send you a picture, but it, the way he landed, when I walked up to him, I've never seen of the hundreds of deer I've shot. I, I walked up to him and he was laying on his back, flat on his back, looked like a, a, a dog wanting a belly rub. I mean, he was, uh, you know, again, uh, just you know, a very unique position. But all of a sudden it dawned on the reason, one of the reasons it meant so much to me is when I go to tag him, I, I, I pulled, you know, then I checked my, my, watch for the for the date and i realized i I, this was not planned but it was november 21st and which was the 57th anniversary of that's when i killed my first deer was on november 21st you know type of thing so it was kind of an anniversary buck and as i said it was uh plus the fact i and i don't even i won't go go into the depot but you know i had i had a heart attack uh, in April and ended up with triple bypass and, and I did cardiac rehab all summer yeah. and our season here doesn't open till, uh, October 1st. And, um, you know, uh, by September 1st, I couldn't even draw a 30 pound bow. You know, and so I, anyway, I borrowed a, it was a 40 pound recurve from, from Gene, Gene had a, a, a lightweight one and I just, I laid it on the kitchen or the dining room table. Every time I walked by, I'd pull it a few times and, you know, a month later I was shooting my, it's a 61 pound tall tines. And, um, it, again, I, the October, the day before our season opened October 1st, I put three arrows in a, in a three inch circle at about 18 yards. And I, uh, that, you know, but I still, I decided I'm not going to shoot at anything over 15 yards. So in fact, you know, both of the bucks I killed were like 10 yards type of thing, but it was, you know, in fact, I, I'm, I'm proud of the fact I held my word because 
it was, uh, I don't remember, the third week in October, maybe. I had a, if he wasn't Boone, he was knocking on the door, big, you know, giant, big, mature buck. And he was standing broadside right in the open at, at you know, I did a timber, but right in open timber. That he, I guessed him at like 26, 27 yards. And, you know, as big as he was, I just didn't feel comfortable about the shot and I just let him walk away type of thing. And, you know, plus it was early and I figured I'd, I'd maybe get another crack at him and stuff. But, uh, um, anyway, as I said, I, uh, not too many guys would have let that deer walk away type of thing. And I just have too much, um, whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, um, I, I love them too much to, to just throw an arrow at one type of thing and hope for the best. Right. You know, so, Wow. Great story, Barry. Absolutely great Thank story. You. Fantastic. So let's uh, let's get into our ten rapid fire questions here. Dusty's got them loaded up. I have no. I'm not familiar with these. So you, yeah. you what's it? You just asked me a question, and what popped in my mind? Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. yep. Just yep. try to get, okay. get to know you a little bit better. We, I don't I don't like to prep you for them because it's better if you don't know what they are. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'm good. I'll, I'll tell you right now. I'm best at. True and false and multiple choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to know. All right, Barry, let's get forward. No, go ahead. Go ahead. What's your best right. hunting tip? My best hunting tip? Yep, your number one hunting uh, tip. Spend, pro- probably spend time in the woods. Um, you know, the practical application. In other words, uh, it's fine to read the books and study it and all the magazine articles, but then go ahead, go out and do the the practical application of it go out by yourself no limitations with you know a time limit or anything like that just slow down and think about what you're seeing and you know try to put the pieces of the puzzles together other than your bow what's one thing you can't hunt without i really like my binoculars um i mean i i and it's not that I need them, but I enjoy them. Uh, meaning, if I see a buck at fifty yards, I like to look at his eyelashes. <laughs> you know, and uh, um, again, I really enjoy. If I've done that before, where I've left the house, and you know, and, and I don't mean go get all the way in the timber and go back out and get them, but I'd I'd left I'd leave the house and get you know, two, 300 yards down the road. And, oh man, I forgot my binoculars, you know, and I'll go back and get them. But, uh, there's a, there's a lot of little things like that, that, that I do, um, that, like pruners, uh, those little ratchet, uh, I use those Florian ratchet pruners that, I mean, I use, like, they're on my belt all the time and I use them every day. I mean, uh, all year long, not just when I'm hunting and stuff, you know, so that, that's another, you know, tool that I that I use all the time and stuff, you know. But anyway, next question. What's your biggest pet peeve in life? Probably <laughs> probably having to go back for something I forgot when um, you know, I'm on the way somewhere. Um, you know, um in other words, I try to plan everything systematic so that I don't need, you know, to oh I mean, I mean I know guys that have they're constantly forgetting. I mean, <laughs> in fact, that, that brings you know, oh, just a quick story. But when we were guiding whitetail hunters, there was one, there was one guy who's from uh, St. Louis. And at the end of his hunt, <laughs> we had to go back through the woods and we picked up seven, seven articles that he had left in the woods on the bottom. You know, I mean, binoculars and cameras and, I mean, range finders and releases. And he just... He'd lay him at the base of his tree and walk away and forget him, you know. And but anyway, I, I'm, I'm saying what I'm saying is if if I leave the house and you know get a mile down the road and something, I've never really forgotten my bow, but <laughs> I know guys that have. But you know, in other words, having to go back to get something that's needed um, is really bothers me because then I'm running late. I couldn't agree with that more. I might miss something. Go ahead. Barry, how old are you today? Uh, 72, October 6th, 44, class of 62 rules. You know, gotcha. so <laughs> graduated from high school at 62. But anyway, yeah, I'm whatever. I was 72 in the last October. Barry, what would the, what would the 70, 72-year-old Barry say today to the 30-year-old Barry, knowing what you know today? Slow down, maybe. Enjoy, you know, the hunt. Hunting is a, 
a, a situation that it we're doing it for personal satisfaction. And I just feel so bad for the kids these days that are there. And, and again, I'm no problem, but for example, a kid that's an avid, avid football player, um, knowing that, um, yeah, no matter how much you love football, you know, if he, he'll play it in sandlot ball, then he'll play it in high school. And if he's really good, he might play it in college. If he's really good, he might go in the NFL. But no matter how good you are, by the time you turn whatever, 35, you got to wrap her up. And I mean, how would I feel loving hunting like I do to have somebody say, oh, yeah, by the way, when you turn 35, you're going to have to become a spectator, you know? And, and as I said, it's just one of those deals that, that they, unfortunately, a lot of the young kids these days, they want to be great, but they don't want to practice. They want to be Michael Jordan, but they want to, they don't want to have to shoot hoops and practice and all this stuff, you know, type of thing. And I'm saying that, the more you're out there, the more you're going to enjoy it and the more, you know, self-satisfaction you're going to get out of it. But as I said, I think if a guy, if a, if a, a younger guy um, slows down on, you know, his everyday behind the house hunting type of thing, but in the same respect, don't put off um, you know, the hunting when you're able to do it. In other words, if, if you're, financially able to go on moose hunts and sheep hunts and car if you if caribou hunts and elk hunting if you want to go in the, the physical uh strenuous type of hunts that's when you need to do it and, and I'm, I'm saying you know you don't put your family on the back burner i'm talking about if you're able to do that you know don't put it off you know, I'll get, uh, you know, wait till the kids get out of school and then I'll wait till they get out of college and oh, he's just starting his, you know, you know, in other words, uh, you put it off and put it off, put it off. Next thing you know, you're an old guy, you know? So <laughs> anyway, been there, done that. Uh, sure. <laughs> you meet a stranger in, in the hotel lobby or in the elevator. They ask what you do for a living. What do you say? Um, I don't know. <laughs> It's funny you said that because we I, I like to toy with people. <laughs> Gene does the same thing. I've sat in a plane. <laughs> I remember one time some lady asked my brother what he did for a living, and he says, I'm a shepherd. You know, <laughs> a shepherd. I mean, you know, like he watches sheep at night, you know, type of thing. Right. But, uh, no, I, I tell him I'm retired, and I, I uh, do, you know, land consulting and game land management. Um, you know, type of thing. I'm, I'm not, I kind of be careful. Uh, I have to feel people out, meaning if I think they're antis, I don't want to get into it because I, I have a, a low tolerance toward ignorance and, you know, <laughs> I just, I don't want to have to get thrown off the plane or out of, out of the, <laughs> the restaurant or whatever it may be. But, uh, um, as I said, I'll just, I'll, tell them I'm, you know, I'm a fun seeker. <laughs> right on. What did you have for breakfast, Barry? What did I have today? I had, what? let me think. I had a, a cup of raw oatmeal with a handful of blueberries, some fresh cut up mango and some, what are they, not raisins, but they call them cra cranberry, craisins or cran dried cranberries on it. Is that nice. good? I'm a lot healthier. I'll tell you right now, I'm a lot healthier than I look. I feel really good. I mean, you know, that, like this heart attack thing, no sweat. Well, maybe just a little sweat, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> sweat. Anyway. Oh, that's funny. You get your own billboard, a blank canvas. What would it say? Repeat that one. If I got my own billboard and yeah, I could put anything on canvas. it. Blank white canvas. What would it say on it? Uh you can put anything. I don't know. Probably, I don't know. I'm not real. I'd have to think about that. But right offhand, I'd say like uh, maybe experience is the best teacher. You know, get out and do it. Um, you know, and and use your common sense and logic and and think about you know. But but do the practical applet. You'll learn more doing it. I remember when I was a little kid. Um, going you know you read about the whatever the history 
you know, and then you go on a class trip to the Smithsonian and uh, you learn more in one day, you know, on a, a field trip to the Smithsonian than you do in a year of, of uh, listening and, you know, in a, at the schoolwork and stuff, you know. So um, okay. anyway, experience, you know, to is, is the best teacher. I say the word That'd successful. Who's the first person that pops in your mind and why? Successful? Yes. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't want to sound hokey, but <laughs> my wife has been really, really good to me. <laughs> she, she, again, I have, uh, and uh, seriously, I don't measure success in as far as, uh, you know, monetary. Um, I, I, uh, I believe that, you know, everybody, I don't, I, mean, I don't even know if it's right, but I believe everybody's been put on this earth for a purpose. And um, but it's a, a accumulation of a bunch my of a bunch of people, and basically my family has allowed me to do some of the things that I've done. But uh, I know, um, I say success. I know some people that um, have been unbelievable. I think success. As far as uh, uh, whatever you want to say, the the uh, uh, okay here example uh, Jack Nicholas. Um, Jack is is been a friend of ours for years. Uh, Gene and I we guided the Nicholas family for I don't remember six seven eight years in Montana. Got to know them, went to Africa with them, et cetera. And I know you know here's Jack um, who is you know, uh, one of the, the world's best, if not the best golfer in the world, but he also, um, is a family man and hanging around him. I've seen, you know, the decisions that he has to make. And one of them is being, you know, in other words, uh, being able to, uh, decide, do I do this or am I, uh, interrupting my family life and, you know, should I just not do this and so forth. And I, I got to admit, um, as I said, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, how much money, you know, he is worth, he's earned every cent of it and he's done it without stepping on very many toes. I'm sure again, that there's been some in the, in the, that wouldn't agree with me, but I've been around the guy, many, many times that I was impressed. I mean, he's a giving person, honest, sincere, and, you know, really knowledgeable. I, I, I do admire him a lot and stuff, you know, but anyway, um, but again, that's, that's just one of many. Right on for sure. What's a day in your life look like? <laughs> I normally get up at somewhere around seven o'clock, six forty five to seven fifteen, something like that. And I, I come out and turn the internet on and read the news and then I'll have some breakfast and um my wife's going to New York. My wife and her sister own a uh, toy shop. We summer back east in Maine. They own a toy shop on the coast in Agunquit, Maine and they're going to a toy buying show. But then I gotta do a land consulting deal. I walk the property like I said in Missouri the week after and then I got four boot camps in a row um, I might throw in a pig hunt there but I got four boot camps and then I got another one uh, land consulting thing in Connecticut and then we might end up where we're talking Gene was talking about you know we're going to do some more sports shows other than that um, I know do a lot of tweaking on stands I live you know right in the timber or right next to the timber, you know, anyway. And I normally, I go to bed at, you know, I don't know, 1030 or something like that. And back to the grind. Uh, what's a hunting day in your life look like? I am hardcore. It kind of depends on the time of the year, meaning our season. When I lived in Montana, as I said, our season opened September 1st and I usually didn't get serious with the whitetails until October. But since we, you know, as I said, we moved to Iowa in 99. So, uh, frankly, um, the entire month of September, unless you go on a trip, you know, and hunt elk or antelope or whatever, another species, um, you know, I stay at home. I've basically lost a whole month, 
you know, but I don't mind that because I'm constantly tweaking and changing stuff. But it's when the season opens the 1st of October, um, I tend, I'll, it's more or less ritual, meaning, you know, I, yeah, I mean, if a booner walks by me, uh, I'll shoot it, but, um, I've got, well, that's another thing I should mention. Um, I, I'm in the middle of, of making another video. A lot of people don't realize I, I again, I've, I've made videos. In fact, the bow hunting October white, I was supposedly, I shot the first two deer on production video with a bow that's wherever, you know, on film type of thing. And I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, you know, it was uh, as, as far as I know it is, but you know, now every, you turn on TV and go in a video, you know, there's, a hundred thousand of them. I just happen to be the guy that shot the first one or first two. But anyway, my, my point is that people didn't, that was back in the early eighties and people don't, I started filming my own hunts right after high school. And here we had a fire in 99 and I lost half of everything I own and um, including a whole bunch of footage and here, the year before last, I found a bunch of it that was in storage that I forgot I had. So I went ahead and I put it all on disc. And but for example, I had 4,400 feet of regular eight, you know, uh, film type of thing. And I had it, I had everything put on disc. And so I, I've got like, I think it was 700 hours of footage of hunting, you know, old footage and I'm putting it together. I've got it edited down to about eight hours now, and I want to edit it down to two 90 minute tapes. And basically it's my entire hunting life, you know, documented. And I've got, um, some really, you know, a lot of great scenes that, um, nobody not only the hunting footage but you know misses and passed up bucks and educational stuff and and you know bear hunting and bow fishing and hogs and you know all kinds of of different i'm going to have it like chapters of a of a book type of thing but uh um i'm planning on putting that together and end up with two 90 minute you know dvds and it's not going to again people are going to have to realize that I mean, it's not going to be the quality. I mean, some of this old footage was filmed, you know, and for example, I got this one seg uh, segment that, of a buck I killed in Vermont in 1964. And then I got, a, it's almost, and it's totally coincidental, a very similar scene um, of a buck I killed I don't remember five years ago, you know, and what I'm saying, it, um, it's the same direction, the same guy dragging the, the deer, the, exactly the same, only it's 50, the same guy, 50 years apart type of thing. And so, so Barry, where can we find more information talking about, you know, the videos that you want to produce and the, the boot camp and the videos that are, yeah, out we now? have a, we have a both uh, our, our website and it's, uh, www.brothersofthebow.com. Um, Gene and I, my brother and I, and then the Mitten brothers, um, Mike, Mark, and David Mitten are three bow hunting friends from Illinois. And we put together these videos. Fr frankly, it was, there was no intent originally. We, we basically took a lot of that footage just for ourselves and share it with our family. And then the people who saw it, they kept saying, you know, man, you need to, you know, produce this stuff, share it with everybody. So we did. And, and, uh, um, we brought primal dreams out first and we won three awards, uh, for that. Um, and I mean, which we, we, uh, we beat out national G in fact, <laughs> It was funny because I had some guy order one, and he called me, and he said, uh, he, he said, who are you guys? And I said, what do you mean? And he says, um, he says I'm a, a cameraman for National Geographic for 18 years. He says, this is good stuff, you know, so which is a really good compliment for, you know, somebody who's a cameraman for Nat Geo for 18 years. Oh, yeah. But anyway, um, we got the videos, and we got books. It's a lot of free reading on the website, Brothers of the Bow. We got free, you know, reading, uh, you know, chapters from different books and video clips, trailers, and you can, you know, artwork, 
like uh, again, there's there's the information. The boot camps, I I had I scheduled actually what's on that the internet on our website is I planned on having three of them this year, and I sold out within two days, and then. The I went ahead. I had a waiting list of you know a couple dozen guys, so I went ahead and scheduled a fourth one, and that sold out the first day. So I can only take fifteen. The the host lodge where I rent this beautiful lodge, and it only has fifteen beds. So I you know I limit my attendees to fifteen per per session. But uh, as I said, I'm, I'm getting up in years, and um, I have to. I'm forced. Well, I say last year, I had three scheduled. I did the first two, and then the night, the night after the second one is when I had the heart attack. <laughs> Those young guys ran me into the ground. That's but anyway, it. anyway, so I I had to have one this year to you know rebook the guys that I had to cancel on last year. So I thought oh, I'll have two more too, and then and that they all filled up instantly. So I had a. I've sold out for every year type. I, I know I hardly ever even advertise, but it's it. They're very popular because apparently they work, and uh, it's a great time. And it's the, the price hasn't gone up in 13 years. And it's as I said, it includes three days and a beautiful lodge and uh, what is 11 you know full cooked meals and home cooked meals type of thing. So it's it's a very good deal, and everybody raves about them. So. That all that info is is on the website and st- stuff. But uh, um, you know, just to say, brothersofthebow dot com. Very cool. Very very cool. Oh, Barry, this is uh, okay. this. It's almost to the two hour mark, and we have. It feels like we've only been talking five minutes. I think it, we have to have you back on the show. I don't know if you'd be up for that, but I don't feel like we've sure. even touched on a lot of the topics that that have come into my head since we've been talking. And I think we've got yeah. an, at least another show at the very minimum. Well, that, that's no, no problem with me. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure, my friend. <laughs> I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed the, this, this conversation. Okay. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking my to you pleasure. some more and uh, having you back on the show. Very good. Barry loves tangents. There's no question about it. But there's a reason. is because his brain is still functioning highly as a, a f- fanatical and highly skilled deer hunter and he's always putting together and contriving these plans on how to better hunt a whitetail that's in his woods and i can see how he just kind of goes off on ideas that pop into his head instantly and i don't think he really has much of a an outline per se he just knows from experience because he gets out there and does it yeah it's just amazing he's like a roll of decks of information on whitetail hunting I love I love the guy. He's just fantastic. He's kind of like my my grandfather that knows everything there is to know about whitetail hunting. And I I, I think we have to do another show with with Barry. In fact, I, I would love it if he would be a frequent contributor to this program because I his the things that he has stuck in his head and the platform that we have for that exact thing it would be a perfect marriage. Yeah, I think uh, I think it would be a great fit for what we got going, Jay. No doubt about it completely agree so mr dusty phillips do you have after that amazing performance by our good friend barry what do you have for a chubby tines tip of the week can you follow that act i i'm gonna try jay you know it's gonna be a tough one no doubt about it but i'm i'm definitely gonna try the chubby tines tip of the week is sponsored by morse's sporting goods firearms use firearms bows use bows located at 85 kentucky falls road in hillsborough new hampshire Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morsesportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about hinge cutting trees, and now is the time. Uh, Spring right around the corner. We're going to get into some uh, habitat management, uh, get your wood set up a little better. And if, if you're going to hinge cut, and you've been thinking about hinge cutting a few trees to make a few beds and maybe to direct the deer in a different direction, do some research on it. Get on YouTube and and watch a guy's hinge cut trees. That way when you go out there, you're not just whacking trees and not knowing the process or the method. Take your time, do your research on hinge cutting, and uh, do it right, do it once, and, and you'll reap the benefits for years to come. 
It's a great idea. I'm fascinated with hinge cutting now. It's, we've heard this a few times. Barry mentioned it. You've talked about it. We've talked about it in some other shows. I'm just fascinated with the whole concept. So uh, yeah, it takes a little bit of skill with your chainsaw, but once you figure right. it out and you, you educate yourself about the process, you'll get it down pat. And uh, next thing you know, you're like an arborist out in the woods. That's that's very cool. Uh, cheers to the, the milestones that this show has set. Uh, thanks to everybody that has listened to the show. I mean, I just it just still blows my mind. We're sitting in the middle of these amazing, talented, diehard deer hunting fans and contributors to the show. And we're right in the middle of it. And there's no place I'd rather be. It's fantastic being right here. And we're just going to keep pushing that record button and keep putting putting these things out so everybody else can keep listening as well you know, if you're if you're that guy that's got one incredible story and, and you just feel like you're the average joe and, and you don't think that you could do a podcast get get with me get with me jay jim shoot us an email dusty big buck registry talk with me about it we'll get comfortable we become we'll become like friends i'll call you we'll, we'll have a conversation and if you got that great story and, and you're just a little hesitant about reaching out, do it. Reach out to us. Yeah, that, that that's the fact. I mean, we love deer stories, and we love finding people that can deliver that story in such a way that we can share the, the little details of how you did it to pass it along to everybody else so that they can use a little bit of that too. Now, Dusty, when we're not hanging out here chit-chatting about deer hunting, where can we find you when you're outside of the studios? Shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. I will try to respond to every email I receive. Look me up on Facebook, Chubby Tines Outdoors, at Chasing Antler on Instagram and Twitter. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not hanging out on the mic here in the studios? Best place uh, is, as usual, the email. The email is the best place, jay at bigbuckregistry.com. If you would like to donate to the show and become a patron of the show because you enjoy listening to the content that we provide, we could always use the help. And here's how you do that. Go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge, P-L-E-D-G-E. And all the instructions will be right there. It's our Patreon page. And there are all kinds of ways to participate in keeping this show alive. We need your help. Also, if you'd like to check out our Facebook page or any of our social media, it's very easy. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Facebook, and every, everything follows suit. So bigbuckregistry.com forward slash whatever the social media platform is. That's how you're going to find us. If you're listening to the show, our, the number one place to listen to this is on iTunes, but there are other places. You can listen to it on iHeartRadio. You can listen to the show on Stitcher. You can now listen to the show on YouTube. We create a video of every single show. Listen to the show in its entirety simply by going to our YouTube channel. And that's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash YouTube. Other than that, you can always give us a call, 724-613-2825, and leave us a voicemail. And I think that's pretty much everywhere the Big Buck Registry is at. Everywhere Big Buck. Well, I'm Dusty Phillips. And I'm Jay Scott. This is the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you guys next week. Can't wait. <laughs>